Are you looking to become a tier one operator in the gaming world? Elevate your games with Black Sight Studio Terrain. Warfare is a dominant theme in almost any post-1945 era conflict, Vietnam definitely included. However, this is a term that's thrown around in wargaming almost as often as it's misunderstood. To see how this concept could be applied to Vietnam wargaming, let's first get a handle on what asymmetrical warfare really is. Asymmetrical warfare is often misunderstood as few against many. If one side of your game has 10 units worth 100 points, and the other has 1,000 units worth only 1 point, the game is balanced by simple multiplication. Picture a lever with a fulcrum in the middle, and the lever still balances out because both ends still carry 1,000 pounds of tabletop capability, and so the game is characterized as asymmetrical. This is not true, or at the very least, it's incomplete. True asymmetrical games give one side virtually all the advantages. Not only more powerful, more expensive units, but also more numbers. Yes, in many Vietnam infantry battles, the Americans and their allies outnumbered the NVA or Viet Cong. Then there's artillery, air support, air mobility, tanks, APCs, the list goes on and on and on. How can we possibly design scenarios where both players can enjoy a fun, challenging experience? The secret sauce is in the victory conditions. In our balanced lever example, picture one side has a thousand points, be it in firepower or mobility, survivability, and the other has only 200. But now move that fulcrum of that lever all the way toward the more powerful side. The fulcrum represents the victory conditions. What either side has to accomplish or prevent the opponent from accomplishing in order to win. This is asymmetrical. In the recent video game release, Friday the 13th, one player takes the role of Jason, and up to eight more play camp counselors. Jason, of course, is incredibly powerful. He's basically unkillable. He can teleport, he simply grabs a counselor and they're dead, but all the counselors have to do is survive. Sure, they may have to repair a phone to call the cops or fix a car, but in the end, they just have to avoid battle. Jason, on the other hand, has to find and kill other players whose only real objective is to avoid him. Jason is also strictly limited in how often he can use these fantastic special abilities. And worst of all, he's absurdly slow. This may seem like an odd example, but this is very, very much like the Americans in a Vietnam War game. They have all the firepower and all the survivability. They have amazing operational mobility via vehicles and helicopters. But once on the ground, they become grindingly slow. They have to find a hidden and elusive enemy. The communists always know where the Americans are. The Americans have to keep their losses as low as possible, evacuate their casualties, avoid shooting near civilians, avoid booby traps, take prisoners, and all the time keep the enemy from escaping. 
Communists, meanwhile, can cheerfully accept horrific casualties. Fire into or through civilian areas, hide, use booby traps, and of course are never required to hold the field. Smack the Americans once by surprise from hidden outposts and run like hell, baiting them into pursuit through terrain sown with your snipers and booby traps. Put another way, if you like playing thieves and rogues in D&D, and always used to get a kick out of annoying the powerful, heavily armored, but slow-moving paladins restricted by lawful good alignments. Consider giving the Viet Cong a try in Vietnam. You may enjoy it. In summary, the Americans, South Vietnamese, South Koreans, Australians, or whatever free world force is on the table will always win the battle. Winning the game, however, should be another matter. If your free world player starts to feel annoyed and frustrated given nearly limitless firepower, but is also hamstrung by rules of engagement that rarely allow him to use this firepower, well, you're on the right track. Denial of battle was a tactic absolutely mastered by the NVA and especially by the Viet Cong. On your table, the communists should never be forced to fight, and almost always have the option to start the actual shooting only when they see fit. Try to design victory conditions where the communists could theoretically, technically, win the game if a shot is never fired by either side. I'm not saying your game should play this way, but try to design that option into your victory conditions. Historically, hundreds of operations were launched from 1966 to 72, where Americans and their allies failed to even find the enemy, and such operations were always chalked up as failures. For American commanders, simply getting the enemy to fight at all was half the fight itself. And it should be the same way on your table. Having no objectives is another way to allow the communists to avoid battle, especially with the Viet Cong. While the NVA was sometimes ordered to hold key positions like roads, supply caches, and especially hilltops to facilitate artillery operations, Fighting the Viet Cong should feel like trying to fight a fog bank with a sledgehammer. While objective locations are a common staple in wargaming, never require the Viet Cong to hold them. Maybe the Viet Cong should have the option of attacking American held checkpoints, roads, bridges, or villages, but strictly as a raid. They should never be required to take and hold them. And if you're using points, always have the biggest VC payoff simply be more American casualties. The Americans, meanwhile, should always have at least some objectives to defend. Even in an offensive operation, defensive objectives might be a road that provides supply support for the ongoing op, or an LZ for further troops, or for dusting off friendly wounded. Attacking objectives is another matter. Operationally, for American commanders, control of terrain was often a secondary concern to trapping, pinning, engaging, and destroying large NVA or Viet Cong units. Villages, roads, and hilltops were often taken only to be given back to the enemy. Tactically, however, objectives can serve as handy scoring mechanisms for the free world player. Just make sure the payout for these objectives isn't too high. Communist dead, and especially communist prisoners, should be just as high if not higher. Hidden movement is another way to allow the communists to deny battle until they're good and ready to open fire. Now, this can be a tough one on the tabletop, where models on the table or counters on a hex grid clearly show where everyone's pieces are. One workable solution is some kind of masked unit mechanic. Say the communist force has 10 fire teams. Okay give the communist player 20 numbered tiles to deploy and move. Obviously, only 10 of them are real units, and 10 of them are dummy units. But the American player never knows which ones are real until he makes contact with them, thus giving the communist player some kind of reaction or opportunity fire, or until the communist player decides to open fire or assault an American position. In any event, the American player never has full information and the communist player will almost always get to fire first. Only then are the communist units revealed and the maneuver tile replaced with actual miniatures or other playing pieces. Myself, Gianna, Dylan, and Rasmus have had great results with this kind of wargaming in my expansion of Barry Doyle's Valor and Victory. 
I've also seen players use this mechanic in miniature wargaming, including Craig Pauls in his fantasy wargames, and Marvin and Jamie Veter in his American Revolution system called Crucible of War. One slight drawback might be that this system doesn't allow the communist side to set up all of their miniatures at once for full visual impact. But I ask you, what good is visual impact in a war game where you are trying to stay hidden? Another idea might be to borrow the hotspot mechanic from Force on Force. Here, the insurgent player sets up five hotspots around the table, perhaps exits from communist tunnel complexes. As reserves and reinforcements arrive, a D6 is rolled for each insurgent unit, with the result being the hotspot that that unit arrives from. If you roll a 6, it means you can choose your entry point at will. American units can find and close down these hotspots, perhaps by fragging a tunnel entrance, etc., but they should always have the feeling of never knowing where the enemy really is or from which direction they might attack. Perhaps the best way of handling hidden units is in a computer simulation. The classic Steel Panther series has some great Vietnam War scenarios for their main battle tank post-1945 expansion. Whether they are playing against the AI or head-to-head -head against another player, the computer can easily track where enemy units are while hiding them from your view, at least until your squad hits an enemy unit or your Hueys start drawing ground fire. Air mobile operations were technically pioneered in the 1930s with parachutes and gliders, but this isn't really what air mobility means in the modern sense. After all, paratroopers arrive on the battlefield widely scattered even in the best of conditions, and can only carry the lightest equipment with them. Gliders at least put all the men in one place, and allow slightly heavier equipment in even small vehicles, but neither paratroopers or gliders can ever be extracted by air, and there's the difference. Gliders don't take off again, and paratroopers can't jump back into the plane. This means that you can only insert World War II era air mobile troops into areas you can reach very quickly by conventional ground operations. See Operation Market Garden for an example on when that doesn't happen. In Vietnam, however, we see the first real use of the combat helicopter on the large scale. In Vietnam, American and Allied troops can be put anywhere and pulled out almost as fast. On the tabletop, this can be recreated even without helicopter miniatures or plane pieces simply by allowing the Americans to enter from any table side. This operational mobility, contrasted against their very slow tactical movement rates, is often their only counter to the communist denial of battle tactics described earlier. On the table, American units can approach suspected communist positions from multiple angles, trapping them in what was first called spear and net tactics, later evolved to search and destroy, and finally sweep and clear. Air mobile operations were usually combined with conventional ground assaults. Helicopter troops would be inserted behind suspected communist positions and deployed in the net. Then would come the spear. Massive infantry battalions, often backed up by tanks and artillery support from multiple nearby fortified fire bases. Uh, this would be off-board artillery support on your miniature table. As the communists tried to withdraw away from the spear, they'd be hung up in the net and destroyed. Tactical bombing was often sometimes used to set up this stall line behind withdrawing communist forces. Of course, this was always easier said than done. One reason is the efficacy of communist air defense. Again, there are no real dogfights over South Vietnam and no real ground battles in North Vietnam. But communist units in South Vietnam should always have at least some air defense on your tabletop. Weapons to shoot down American helicopters. Civilians and the media should be a factor on many of your Vietnam battlefields. Neither side should really control the civilians, as South Vietnamese civilians were both courted and terrified by both sides in equal measure. Randomized movement can quickly and simply be implemented during each side's movement phase. Say, roll a dice to see if a group of civilians move, and then roll another to see in which direction they move. Something like that. But the difference is that communists should be allowed to, if they choose, to use the civilians as human shields. Whichever way they run, or wherever they are, the communists should be able to use civilians to hide behind or amidst them. And free roll forces should not be allowed to fire into or through civilians. 
or at the very least, if they do, they incur massive penalties, perhaps to victory points, or perhaps to the morale of their units. Force on Force does a great job with this. The reason for these restrictions isn't so much a superior morality, but the idea that the Americans were trying to win what was called the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. They were trying to get the civilians on their side. They were also always being photographed and filmed. Vietnam is often described as a war won on the battlefield, but lost on television. This is also a big reason for the severe restrictions the Americans should have on how many casualties they can take. Images of dead or horribly wounded Americans beamed live into American living rooms is a huge part of what eventually lost the Americans this war. Now, some games have the news team actually on the table as a unit and propose rules like American and civilian casualties somehow count less if they take place outside the news team's line of sight. If you want to explore this route, consider having the communist player control the news team so that the news team is always in the most inconvenient and restrictive place for the American commander. A quiet word of warning, however, this kind of mechanic leads to the American player, quote, seeing what he can get away with, where dead and wounded Americans, and especially civilians, somehow don't count if nobody saw it. This has the potential to lead to some dark places. So just make sure that everyone at your table is cool with this before trying it out. Casualty evacuation, or case evac for short, should be a crucial part of almost any modern era war game, Vietnam definitely included. In addition to just losing abstract combat power through sustaining casualties, the burden of caring for and evacuating said casualties is a vital facet in what makes an asymmetrical war game asymmetrical. In Vietnam, casualty evacuation is a requirement that should be assessed only upon the Americans and their free world allies. For the soldier, the knowledge that even if you were hit, no matter what happened, you would not be left behind, was the bedrock on which much of their morale was based. Furthermore, battlefield medicine had by now advanced to the point to where, if you made it to the helicopter for dust-off, your statistical chance of survival exceeded 95%. Even in the event that you were killed on the field outright, the knowledge, that one way or another you would make it home provided much needed psychological and emotional fortitude. Morale aside, there are practical military reasons for never leaving your casualties on the field. Wounded men might be brought back into service. Wounded heroes being well cared for are far easier for the public to reconcile than men killed, or worse, simply vanished. Wounded men can be taken prisoner and tortured. Even the dead are massive sources of intelligence and uh, propaganda for unscrupulous insurgents not afraid to profane the remains of their foe. For all these reasons, free world units that take hits should not simply be removed from the table the way it's done in most war games. Mechanics should be in place to somehow get wounded or even killed off the table. Enemy forces taking possession of friendly casualties should be a borderline game-ending event. I can speak from personal experience that in games with Dylan, Gianna, and Rasmus, where we've had American or Australian casualties bleeding out in the field somewhere, while medics desperately try to get to them, while more Vietnamese charge that very same position through hails of frantic, friendly, protective fire. Man, these are some of the most intense narrative moments we've had in our Valorant Victory Vietnam games. Special Forces were a big part of the tactics in the Vietnam War. American Green Berets and Rangers, Marine Recon, Navy SEALs, Australian SAS, South Korean Marines, South Vietnamese Rangers, and the so-called WERPs, or Long Range Reconnaissance Patrols. These are just a few of the options available. In general, these should be reserved for skirmish games recreating surprise raids. Pitched battles should usually be avoided, as this was not how Special Forces were used. Because Special Forces almost always struck with surprise, 
Many such games might be best handled as some sort of solitaire system. With the Viet Cong or NVA handled via a reactive AI mechanic. One quick note, special forces were also often used not just to attack the enemy, but train friendly insurgents. Known by the French as the Montagnard, or People of the Mountain, these highland tribes were actually not ethnically Vietnamese or Laotian at all, and they positively hated the Vietnamese communists. Tough, independent, and with intimate knowledge of the terrain, they made for perfect counterinsurgent insurgents. In a few months, a single able team of 12 Green Berets could train perhaps a thousand Montagnard guerrillas. And since these weren't technically American troops, they could legally operate in places like Cambodia or Laos or even North Vietnam, becoming a significant threat to communist operations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So that's our look at tabletop tactics of the Vietnam War. Hopefully I've shed a little light on what is a very complex and often misunderstood conflict, or even better, provided a few ideas for your own war games. Come back next episode where we look at the big picture and lessons learned during the Vietnam War. We'll look at the overall American and communist objectives, sketch out the Cold War context, what happened when the Americans finally got out of Vietnam, and also subsequent wars the Vietnamese fought with Cambodia and China. But now, let's talk about what you think. Have you seen some of these tabletop tactics in your games? Do you have any questions or feedback on the material presented so far? Please get involved in the comments below. For now, this is Ariskany, and as always, Tango Mike for listening.